I reception. I've got it. So oh, very so warm welcome to all of you from behalf of ADR. Uh, some very well-known names and faces are visible in the audience and it's in, indeed an honor that you have chosen to come for this event. A few introductory remarks. I think many of you know about the LCJN lecture. Uh, it's the fourth LCJN lecture. Uh, from ADR side, we are hosting this lecture, merely hosting it. It's really being hosted by the family. Uh, having had the privilege of knowing Sri LCJN, I'll make a few remarks, not take too much time because we are all eager to hear the main speakers. At this time when we are facing many questions of democracy, uh, I often think of Mr. Jain for the following reason. I think uh, he first must have voted in 1950, long before I was born. And uh, as a young man, he did not have the right to vote because we were not an independent country. And I re remember many conversations with him where how precious he felt this independence, democracy, and the right to vote is. Almost something like very hard fought one, bot ladai ke baad wo mila, and almost something sacred. And we used to have several discussions about this. I think we have to recapture that spirit today uh, about how sacred and important the right to vote is, and whether we all of us as citizens are exercising it properly and with responsibility. The uh, one of his collected works is going to be released uh, shortly. But the other thing I wanted to mention, because I see some young faces here, uh, if there was a role model that one has to have about how a person helps younger people to grow and contribute to society, it is definitely Mr. L.C. Jain. Very gracious, very affectionate, uh, very insightful and always encouraging and giving good suggestions to various, there are many civil society leaders, some are here in this hall, some are outside, and all of them have had the privilege, uh, including ADR, of being mentored by him. So it's a great honor for us to uh, host his lecture. A few words about ADR. Many of you know about the Association for Democratic Reforms, and our mission really is to try and help improve elections and democracy and political campaigns in this country. Uh, I do not know whether we have been successful or not, but uh, a few important issues I wanted to highlight, and we need everybody's help and advice on this, because I think periodically we come across this crisis in democracy and uh, we have been working on informing voters and the assumption has been that if voters are well informed about parties, candidates, about various issues, many of the RTI activists are sitting here. Uh, my congratulations to them who have brought out very inf important information uh, regarding elections, money and so on. But we are not able to reach the voters' hearts and minds. And I think that task still remains. And we in ADR are fully committed to it. And we would certainly seek your advice and suggestions. I think we are available on email, internet, phones, and we can have discussions now also. If you would really look forward to your suggestions on how to make things uh, happen. So I have been uh, instructed to uh, help launch the book, the collected works. Uh, of the gentle revolutionary. So I would request uh, the author, uh, Mr. Tridip, to kindly come on stage. Is he around? Yes. yes. And also request the Jain family, in particular, to please come on stage. No marks for guessing who is the gentle revolutionary, but I'm sure they will tell us who the gentle revolutionary is. And uh, both of our distinguished speakers, we would request you to come forward to release that book.
release. Uh, it is now uh, our privilege from ADR to invite uh, the chairperson of today's meeting, uh, Dr. Romila Thapar, Professor Romila Thapar, to make her introductory remarks, and then we will be listening to Justice A.P. Shah's lecture. So, Madam, can we request you? Can Certainly. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is an occasion when one reminisces, when one reminisces about an old and long and lasting friendship. And I hope that you will forgive me because when we people become old, as I am, we enjoy reminiscing and we enjoy imposing our reminiscences on anybody who's there to listen. I first met Lakshmi, Lakshmi Chand Jain, Lakshmi as we all called him, in the 1960s. And let me say a couple of words about the 1960s because I think that was a very special period. Uh, more so perhaps when one tries to compare that period with more recent times. Independence had been stabilized by then. We were trying to consolidate the Indian nation into a secular democracy. And there were endless discussions and debates on the economy, the degree to which it should be planned, on Indian society, how was society to modernize in the context of the structure that we had inherited of caste, uh, on secularity and what was meant by secularism and a secular society on which many of us wrote at great length, should religious institutions control the functioning of society and if so, to what degree and how. And last but not least, the centrality of ensuring the freedom of speech that was something we were very, very insistent about and discussed at great length. Fortunately, fortunately, these discussions and consequent actions led to some initial stabilization of the economy and society, for which I think we should be very grateful because it gave us a base for many, many years when one compares the emergence of India as an independent nation with other nations of that time, we had a distinct advantage because we had given so much thought and so much action to precisely these questions. There was a perceptible move towards social justice and a consciousness of the need to annul the social inequality inherent in the earlier society. And above all, there was an awareness of citizenship what does it mean, the change from being the subjects of the Raj to becoming independent citizens of a nation? A tremendous change, a historical breakthrough, as it were, uh, which perhaps we didn't fully recognize at that time. Uh, this was the broad context in which we argued the possible directions that India could take. And the arguments were intense and ranged over hu a huge span. There were many, many people that were grappling with these ideas and the activities that went with them. Lakshmi was among those that grappled more firmly and fiercely and with great conviction. And, and that is something that I deeply remember about him, that, that sense of conviction uh, which is so essential in people who are uh, rare thinkers. He had led students in the Quit India movement of 1942, as is remembered by many contemporaries. He'd worked with refugees after partition as a camp commandant in refugee camps. He joined Kamla Devi in uh, reviving handicrafts and the cooperative movement. And the Cottage Industries Emporium, once, in its best days, was one of the results of his efforts. 
When there was talk of development, he knew the nitty gritty that many others did not, precisely because he was working in areas that others were not working on directly and were largely theorizing about. And more than that, being a bright thinking, thoughtful person, he recognized the implications of the decisions that were being taken. That is something that people often miss out on. They take decisions, they have theories and ideas and so on. What the implications are in real life is something that is not always very apparent. On many occasions when all this was being discussed, he would formulate his ideas on decentrali decentralization, not just as theory, but in terms of the actual involvement of local institutions, which for him was a very important question. His emphasis was on giving authority and finance to local people and assisting them to organize essential institutions more particularly those associated with education and health. And his insistence on giving, fierce, of giving both face and voice to those people who were generally ignored was more than just being generous to other human beings. He had the awareness of a sensitive person recognizing the outcomes of these activities. And in a sense, much of this was a reinforcement of his commitment to Gandhi's ways of thinking and acting, a commitment that gave a tremendous direction to his life. And then, two things happened that brought Lakshmi even more center stage into the lives of many of us and showed him to be a man of both, both thought and action. The first thing was that he and Devaki got married. And that brought him right into our lives. How? All those of us that had known Devaki as a close friend, like myself, now got to know him and admire him as well. The second thing was that suddenly out of the blue, he established the super bazaar cooperative stores, which controlled prices for the extensive sale of items of daily use. This was a godsend for those with small incomes, but more importantly, it was also a demonstration of his ability to put ideas into form and make them functional. How I remember how impressed, how deeply impressed all of us were, and we talked about it for days, that here was a man who'd just gone out and done it without constantly talking about what was needing to be done and showed us how it could be done. That is terribly, terribly important, and we often don't recognize the importance of people who can do that. And as we repeated to ourselves that knowing him was, to use his own words, another kind of education. Later, he received the well-deserved Max Essay Award, and he had a disinclination to accept state honors, so this was quite acceptable. He went as High Commissioner to South Africa, an opportune time for him to bring Gandhian thought to the forefront. Thinking of present times, as we all do, I often wonder what he would have said about the situation today. The economy is far from Gandhian and has registered or seems to be registering something of a failure. The economy does not speak to the peasant and does not speak to the man in the street. Politics is being used to strengthen caste hierarchies instead of working towards a society that doesn't have hierarchies. And the freedom to think, absolutely fundamental, is being slowly eroded. I have a gut feeling that he, had he been alive today, would have joined many of us in approving of the protests that are going on 
right around the country. The protests by the students and even more by the women, an extremely important departure in the history of Indian society. He would have been among them, pleased that they were not only showing courage and grit, but making a determined point about how they visualized their future as citizens and rejecting the kind of society that they did not want. That their concern was ethically charged, and this is a very important point that I would like to underline, the ethics of the actions that we undertake and the theories that we op uh, propagate today. That their concern was ethically charged, unlike so much that is unethical in present times, would have, been, would have had a very strong appeal for him. In some ways, what is happening today takes me back to the 1960s again, but perhaps even earlier to the struggle for freedom. Those were the creative years when we worked towards a secular democracy in India. Now, we are trying desperately to protect what we created then and to protect it from being rapidly dismantled in diverse ways. In these times, in our times, one searches for ways to stabilize society and economy once again. One wishes, equally desperately, that people like, like Lakshmi were still with us. He would then have had to change the title of his book and call it not Two Freedom Struggles, but Three Freedom Struggles in One Life. It is in the fitness of things that the memory of Lakshmi should be celebrated in a discussion of where we are at in terms of defending the rights of citizens and in upholding the freedoms inherent in our society, as long as it is a secular democratic society. We must therefore thank the Association for Democratic Reforms and the family of Lakshmi Jain for giving us this opportunity, opportunity to hear Justice A.P. Shah. He will be speaking on Fighting for Freedoms, the Supreme Court in the 21st century. Justice A.P. Shah is among the most well-known and reputed judges in India. And I won't go through all the many courts over which he held sway. We should remember that the real breakthrough in gender equality, gay rights, and the striking down of Section 377 was by a judgment not of the Supreme Court, but of the Delhi High Court, a bench of Chief Justice Shah and Justice Murlidhar. When occasion demands it, he is... When occasion demands it, he is an outspoken and fearless critic, both of the government and of the judiciary. For him, the freedom of speech is fundamental, and he describes it as the lifeline of any democratic institution. When, in certain judgments, citizens come to doubt the credibility of the judiciary, it is reassuring to know that the judges of integrity and commitment to the cause of a free democracy, such as Justice Shah, will not hesitate to express publicly what they think. To have that assurance is something invaluable. May I ask Justice Shah now to deliver his lecture. Professor Romila Thapar, Mr. Tirochan Shastri, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all of you. 
at the outset i would like to thank the jain family for having invited me at this edition of the lc jain memorial lecture i didn't have occasion to meet him personally but i have read a great deal about him and his stellar work and contribution to society he would have been a young man when mahatma gandhi passed away in 1948 but he embodied the spirit of gandhi values in the best possible way indeed he has been described as an impassioned crusader of what gandhi called the second freedom struggle for a just and equitable india mr jain's autobiography titled civil disobedience is a fascinating book especially and very revelatory in that he makes extensive observations on the emergency years recall that he was among the few brave ones who mobilized people for an anti emergency movement what he says in the book is relevant even now and remembering him in today's times could not be more apposite what i found especially interesting that the disputed structure is the holy birthplace of lord rama the need for this addendum is highly questionable given that the bench had already unanimously decided the case on constitutional principles and the addendum was not serving the role of a concurring judgment instead the addendum seems to reinforce the supremacy of hindu theological constructions which the founder members of the in constituent assembly clearly rejected a key issue that arose in this judgment was the issue of equity the supreme court was of the view that allahabad high court's decision to divide the property into three parts was not feasible in view of the need to maintain peace and tranquility however whether the supreme court judgment resulted in complete justice is questionable since it still seems like despite acknowledging the illegality committed by the hindus first in 1949 by clandestinely keeping ram lilla ram lalla idols in the mosque and secondly by wantonly demolishing demolishing the mosque in 1992 the court effectively rewarded the wrongdoer this goes against the doctrine of equity which requires you to approve the court with clean hands given the court's finding one wonders if the mosque had not been demolished would it still be have been given to the to the hindu parties but let me concede on this part of the problem lies in the fact that although the judgment is an exceptional scholarship on hindu law the dispute was not ideally placed to be settled by courts and should have been resolved politically as suhas parshikar a political analyst notes courts when they broker peace do not necessarily bring closure to disputes they only give momentary space for disputes to reconfigure maybe a south african style truth and reconciliation commission would have been a greater idea the issue of impunity which i discussed in the context of non implementation of the sabrimala judgment and the failure of the court to provide or ensure say passage to women devotees comes up once again in ayodhya let me explain this relying on the tenor of the court's decision which recognizes of the demolition of babri masjid but does not act on it the hindu mahasabha has begun pressing for the withdrawal of criminal cases against the car sevaks in the demolition of 1992 and involved in the ensuing violence not only that it is also demanding that the car sevaks be given government pensions and their names be listed in the temple that will be eventually built on the site of babri masjid the vishwa hindu parishad not to be left behind uh the the, the not states that it will make similar claims in respect of 3000 other mosques in the country whether the supreme court's assurance that the places of worship act imposes a non derogable 
obligation towards enforcing India's constitutional commitment to secularism will amount to anything in practice, or will the judgment only serve as a shot in the arm of Hindus, will depend in part on the court's ability to ensure the proper enforcement of its judgment. More fundamentally, though, does this judgment actually, this is my question, does it really strengthen or even sustain secularism in this country? Now let me add to this a, some, I want to share a personal story on this Ayodhya judgment. You will recall that this matter was referred to the mediation to a panel of three members. And Mr. Faizur Rahman, a resident of Chennai, wrote a, a op-ed in Hindu, suggesting that the Muslim parties should give up the claim over Babri land, Babri mosque. And in return, the Hindu party should say that that's all. This is our end of our dispute. And they should not rake up new issues, something like uh, Kashi or uh, Banaras and whatever I mean. So this was his suggestion. So I happened to meet, soon thereafter, I happened to meet a very high functionary in the RSS, a very respected man. So I put it to him that this is a good suggestion. It seems that the Muslims are in a mood to settle. They are offering this land. And all that is required is assurance from your side that this, is, this will not be wrecked up in respect of other places of worship. So he told me that the Hindus would not give any assurance of this type. He said that the Muslims must surrender the land. And if the government wants to give them something, some land, etc., it's for the government to do. But from our side, we will not give any such assurance. Eventually, the mediation failed, and the matter was decided by the court. But then I come to the last part of Ayodhya, that is the question of actual implementation of the judgment. I'm inclined to agree with Madhav Godbole, former Home Secretary in this regard. He asked whether giving five acres of alternate land to Muslims for constructing a mosque is the most appropriate or adequate compensation. He also asked what happens to the psychological hurt caused to the Muslims by destroying this place of worship. In an ideal situation, he says, the court should have asked the state and central governments to rebuild the mosque. Indeed, Mr. P. N. Narsi Rao, the then Prime Minister, when the mosque was demolished, had announced this in Parliament and later wanted it fulfilled. The Gujarat High Court, too, has ordered compensation for wherever the, uh, the places of worship were damaged in riots, mainly masjids. And they said that you must, state must compensate, and with the state fund, this will be restored and rebuilt. So the, 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 unfortunately, the Gujarat High Court judgment was stayed by the Supreme Court just for asking. And, the, and you know that you must have read about it, that the, this land is given to the Muslim community some 25 kilometers away from Ayodhya. So this is more of a humiliation for Muslim. I wish that the court had thought about, the, about a better solution for, as a, as a, uh, for, keeping a, for putting a quietus on this issue. And lastly, I come to Kashmir. As a, there are many sets of orders and judgments. According to me, the Supreme Court's orders on Kashmir represents a missed opportunity for the court to come out strongly in favor of fundamental rights and fulfill its role as the sentinel on the key wife. Three sets of petitions relating to Kashmir were filed before the court. The first related to the communication slowdown and section 144 orders prohibiting public gatherings that were imposed on 5-8-2019. The second set related to the habeas corpus petitions that were filed against the illegal arrest and detention of individuals, including minors, under the Draconian Public Safety Act. The third set relates to the constitutional challenge to the government's de decision to amend Article 370 of the Constitution and breaking up the state of Jammu and Kashmir into union territories. In all three cases, the court has failed to give 
a satisfactory resolution even after six months. For the purpose of this speech, I want to primarily focus on the internet shutdown case that is known as Anur Anur the, uh, Anuradha Basin case, which was finally decided in January. The court's judgment is laudable in many respects. It divided, it directed the government to publish all orders, present and future, authorizing the suspension of the internet landline services and prohibiting public gatherings. It rejected the government's argument that national security consideration precluded a judicial review. It also gave constitutional protection to freedom of speech and expression and the freedom to practice any profession or carry on any trade, business or occupation over the medium of internet. Though it did not go as far as to declare the right to access the internet a fundamental right. Most importantly, the court made it clear that an indefinite suspension of internet services is potentially, is, is patently unconstitutional. Unfortunately, Despite these, these observations, the Supreme Court failed to actually decide the matter. The purported reason seems to be that it did not have all the orders in front of it and the situation was changing on the ground daily. However, this reasoning seems to be tenuous when we consider that a few sample shutdown orders were placed before it with detailed arguments about their constitutionality and the rather unconstitutionality, and the court could have easily directed the government to file remaining orders. They rely on the famous uh, observation of Lon Fuller, there can be no greater legal monstrosity than a secret statute. That's a praiseworthy observation. But it did not result in practical benefit, given that the government was effectively allowed to take advantage of its own wrong, of not publishing all the orders and submitting it before the court. The court expressed its anguish that the government has not done it, but the court did not order the government to publish, to produce all the orders before the court. After ruling that the suspension of communication services must adhere to the principles of necessity and proportionality, the court failed to apply this principle to actually decide the legality of the communication shutdown in Kashmir Indeed, it directed the fresh publication of all orders with the review committee reviewing all these orders. They also quoted uh, Lord Diplock's uh, aphorism. You must not use a steam hammer to crack a nut if a nutcracker would do. That's a very famous uh, observation of uh, Lord Diplock. But for the people of Kashmir, it is meaningless. The, Judicial review, ladies and gentlemen, involves more than a mere declaration of law. It requires the application of law to the facts in hand. And the facts, quite simply, are that for more than 150 days, and even today, the people of Kashmir are without a proper functioning internet. The impact of the communication shutdown has been severe. It has affected medical supplies, attendance in schools, tourism, and resulted in loss of business, of opportunity. The, as per the Kashmir Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the loss is computed between August 5 and December 5, 2019 of 15,000 crores. The loss of jobs in the handicraft industry is said to be around 50,000 and in the hospitality industries is about 10,000. As per the data of JNK Tourism Department, this is the official data, there is a drop of 86 tourists visiting the state. So it's not only Kashmir, it's also Jammu. The whole region is hit by the, by the lockdown. People, ordinary citizens, have been prevented from performing the simplest of tasks we take for granted whether it was filing GST returns, upgrading driving licenses, or applying for college admissions, and had to rely on what is now known as the Internet Express, as reported by the Quint. Quint, Quint said that the train from Srinagar to a town called Banihal, it's a 120-kilometer journey, where broadband facilities were functioning, 
to attempt to finish this task. So one had to travel to Banihal, 120 kilometers, just to get few minutes of internet in a cyber cafe. This is apart from the fear that gripped the valley and the emotional and mental stress caused by not being able to get in touch with your loved ones. To these people, ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Court judgment in Anudara Basin has offered scant relief. We now have a situation where the government has whitelisted various websites and permitted the resumption of 2G services. Although empirical analysis has shown that of the 310 whitelisted websites and services, only 126 were usable to some degree. Social media sites and peer-to-peer -peer communication apps are still prohibited. Deep questions remain about whether whitelisting is proportionate because in the privacy judgment itself, the court said that the every act of executive taking away the fundamental rights must be tested on the principle of proportionality. So whitelisting is whether it itself is proportionate or not, no, God knows. I mean, this is to be addressed by the Jammu and Kashmir High Court sometime in foreseeable future, future and this would continue. Meanwhile, I mean, Kashmir continues to face the longest intentional internet shutdown ever recorded in any democratic country. As Aniket Aga and Chitra Gada Saudari note, we seem to not care in integrating a people via an armed siege, in silencing their voices and dismissing their pain, we are also abrogating our own humanity. <laughs> Unfortunately, the lack of an effective remedy and the trend of judicial evasion is also evasive, is also visible in the court's handling of other cases dealing with Kashmir. Dr. Samir Kaul, a, a, a very famous doctor from Srinagar filed, had filed a PIL before the Supreme Court seeking restoration of internet facilities in hospitals and other medical establishments in Jammu and Kashmir, highlighting how the internet shutdown was resulting in delays in accessing, just see this, medical reports, delays in surgical and other medical procedures, and difficulties in accessing life-saving drugs and baby food items that were mostly available online. He was told by the Supreme Court to approach the High Court to avail the appropriate legal remedy. Now, let us come to the, the habeas corpus petitions. A petition had been moved on behalf of detained CPIM leader, Mr. Bahamut Yusuf Tarigami, challenging his <coughs> illegal detention. The Supreme Court supposedly permitted Sitaram Yachuri to visit his colleague, Mr. Tarigami, only on the condition that he file an affidavit on his return that he not engage in any political activity during the course of his visit. Subsequently, while allowing Tarigami to visit Delhi to avail medical treatment, the, court, the Supreme Court held that challenge to his allegedly illegal detention was not urgent and would come up in due course. The directions by the court are about Mr. Yachuri particularly are surprising. Considering that a habeas corpus petition, actually it means produce the body, that it's a, it's a Latin phrase which means produce the body. So we have to, the court has to decide the legality or illegality of the, of the, of the detention. Now the, instead of entertaining the petition, the court uses his occasion to impose conditions and place restriction on the free movement in Kashmir. We must remember that there was no prohibition at any time against visiting Kashmir, and the court's order had the effect of putting in place such restrictions. In doing so, the court seemed even more, I mean, I'm using Lord Denning's uh, words, seemed even more executive-minded than the executive itself. Even the PIL against the alleged reported illegal detention of juveniles and police excesses in dealing with juveniles in the context of the aftermath of Article 370 decision in Jammu and Kashmir was disposed of on the basis of the report of Juvenile Justice Committee of the High Court of Jammu and Kashmir, despite many media reports to the contrary. The court directed that if there was any case of illegal detention of a, of a juvenile minor, 
the petitioners were at liberty to approach the appropriate legal forum, namely the High Court for redressal of their grievances. These cases, ladies and gentlemen, represent instances where despite the urgency of the matter and the increase in the sanction strength of the Supreme Court, it has failed to decide this matter expeditiously. Instead, it has passed the buck to the High Court, which has reportedly received over 2,500 habeas corpus appeals since August 5, even though it is functioning with half of its strength of only 17 judges, and it's now eight or nine actually working there. As the senior advocates, Raju Ramchandran and Chandra Uden Singh have pertinently asked, and this is a very pertinent question they asked, as the court turns 70 in a few months, is the sentinel sufficiently alert, or is it in danger of losing the plot? Moving on, several orders of the Supreme Court, including some orders in the Kashmir matter, suggest that the role of the Supreme Court as a counter-majority institution, that is, as one which seeks to keep majority and impulses in check, is diminishing. On the other hand, as suggested by constitutional scholar Gautam Bhatia, and this is one topic which I will discuss with you in some detail, Mr. Gautam Bhatia said that the court seems to be slowly taking on attributes of the executive itself. It seems to be drifting from a rights court to an executive court. As Bhatia points out, behaving, believing, behaving in a way that is indistinguishable from the government, often issuing important policy decisions through its judgment, prioritizing cases in specific and sometimes worrisome ways, and undertaking actions that would ordinarily be considered the domain of the government. The most obvious example of all this was the preparation of the National Register of Citizens, or the NRC. The NRC was intended to tackle concerns of lawlessness, migration, and cultural issues in Assam. The Supreme Court had, many years back, had described the illegal migration happening in Assam by Bangladeshi Muslims as an external aggression or an invasion of India. The Supreme Court decided the mostly poor and illiterate people who are being made to prove that they are Indian citizens. Based on documents such as of birth, schooling, and land ownership, these documents are e not easy to find and put together. Even if they are put together, they are rejected for issues of English spelling. So sometimes Ahmed became Mahmud. So the application is rejected. Then there will be some mistake in age or date of birth. Again, the person is declared as a foreigner. And the, the way the foreigner tribunal function is as uh, when we are amazed because some uh, official record, copies of official record was produced before us. These foreign tribunals are manned by people who are appointed on yearly basis. And the Criteria for continuation of a, of a foreign tribunal member is how many cases he has declared the person as foreigners. If the number is less, he will be discontinued. There had to be more and more people. And in fact, during the hearing, uh, Chief Justice Gogoi asked, asked the, uh, the authorities as to how many uh, people are there in a particular detention center. So they said 900. So uh, Chief Justice got furious. He said, "Why 900? There should have been thousands in the in the in the uh, detention center. Coming this from the court of India, a rights court. Do you still believe that it's a it's a rights court? So the this is the, this is where the I think Harish Mandar has some sort of a uh, disagreement with the judges and he." asked for recusal of the Chief Justice, and ultimately he recused himself. So then another fascination, which is very interesting development of the, of the era of the last Chief Justice, is the sealed covers. This is the travesty of the worst order, is the newfound attraction for sealed covers. Secrecy can, in limited circumstances, be justified by the executive. But the distinguishing feature of a judicial institution is transparency. For only then can the institution assure the people that it is giving everyone a fair and equal chance to be heard. 
This has happened too often to be brushed aside as a mere idiosyncrasy of one particular judge or a bench. It has happened in the NRC case. In NRC case, the Supreme Court even refused to share the document with the Attorney General of India. The Rafael case, same. The CBI chief's case and the electoral bonds case, to name uh, but a few. But the climax was, according to me, the, the, uh, the case of biopic of the prime minister, where the election commission was asked to make a report. Again, it was given in a sealed cover. So this everything is in sealed cover. If the court really is serious about the taking a departure from this unfortunate legacy, my suggestion to the Supreme Court is, of course, they won't pay any attention to me, but the, my suggestion is that they should first release judicially all these sealed cover documents. Let the people of India <laughs> see all these documents. Another instance is the court's worrisome practice when it comes to the privatization of cases. The court found it, it had no time to deal with the many civil rights related cases that were lying before it, it pertaining to Kashmir. I mean, the Chief Justice said that it had no time to take up these cases. Mr. Gautam Bhatia then tells us about the case pertaining to electoral bonds. Mr. Tilochan Shastri is here, so I must tell you this particular statement by Mr. Bhatia. So reports suggest that over 6,000 crore rupees have been collected by political parties under this scheme, the majority by the ruling establishment. And this is all anonymous because it's, it is kept confidential. The Supreme Court refused to say the issuance of such bonds and instead asked for details of the contributors to be submitted again in a sealed cover. He, the court said it would, it would assess in due course. But that assessment never came. And many elections, central and states, have happened since then. Inaction, ladies and gentlemen, also sends out powerful signal, as we can see in this case. This inaction also spoke louder than words when the court found it. It had no time to deal with the many civil rights related cases that were lying before it. In the case of the CA2, the Chief Justice of India first says, Petitions will be heard only after people stop violence. This was his statement when the first petitions came into the... So either he said, you go to the street or you come to us. As if the good behavior were a condition precedent for seeking protection of fundamental rights. Scores of petitions were filed, were filed in the month of December 2019. The whole country was polarized. And there was even, even violence perpetrated against peaceful protesters, protesters by state authorities themselves. I mean, one should really... I mean, I wish that you, you were also present when the people's tabular on UP police excesses were conducted. You should have seen what they have done to the protesters uh, against uh, CAAA. The, uh, so the Supreme Court, again, pushes the matter beyond four weeks. So I feel that this is really disappointing. But ladies and gentlemen, finally, as I was putting this talk together, I realized that even if I was critical of certain decisions of the Supreme Court, the fact remains that there is a high degree of constitutional faith in India today. Look at the people reading uh, uh, those uh, preamble and the provisions of the Constitution in public. Professor Bakshi uses this phrase constitutional faith to describe the belief in society that the judicial process is key to anchoring India back unto the path of democracy, or the re-democratization, re he uses the words beautifully, re-democratization of democratic polity. I agree with him. As a people, I think we still believe that one of the few things to be proud of in the Indian democratic setup is the free and fair judicial process that we are promised through the Constitution, which keeps the executive and legislature in check, be they in the, set, the center or the state. The institution that is judiciary is what we always turn to whenever the state abuses its power or our fundamental freedoms are threatened. We truly believe that the courts can be our savior. But ladies and gentlemen, just playing savior though is rarely enough. The value of a judiciary is measured by its fidelity to the constitutional scheme that birthed it. When George Grote used the term constitutional morality, in his study of Athenian 
democracy titled A History of Greece. He was referring to the commitment to the process and structure of the constitution, as well as a commitment to freedom embodied in things like such as free speech, accountability, and transparency. This resonated with Ambedkar too, when he recognized the role of constitutional morality had played in the working of the Athenian uh, democracy. But he also recognized that constitutional morality had to be cultivated. And it did not merely come into existence because the constitution was written in a certain way and the constitutional order was always vulnerable and at risk. Our Supreme Court has used this phrase constitutional morality several times in judgment and I plead guilty for first using this phrase in Nas Foundation. I used it as a, some sort of a contrast between public morality and constitutional morality. I said that the majority may think that the, uh, the uh, homosexuality is against the, uh, against the morality of, the, of the, uh, their morality, but it has to be a morality of the constitution and where it stands. It fails that test. But this is used by the judges in quite frequently. But I'm, I'm saying, instead of pointing outwards, I think the court should be self reflective and should ask whether the institution itself is loyal to the spirit of constitutionalism, to this idea of constitutional morality. Equally, I believe it is for the Supreme Court as the custodian of the constitution and the ultimate protector of our fundamental rights to decide whether or not it deserves the constitutional faith that the people of India repose in it and whether or not it, it lives up to these expectations. The right answers will lead to the Supreme Court retaining its status as one of the world's powerful democratic institutions. As an eternal optimist, I believe that the Supreme Court of India will recognize the missteps it has taken and correct course correction sooner than later. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that you will agree with me that we have heard an absolutely riveting analysis of where we are at. I remember my young days when we were told that the democratic structure of society depended on the balance of three aspects of function the executive, the legisla legislature, and the judiciary. And as politics and history went on in the last 70 years, we had moments when the legislature and the executive did not behave as they should have. And we were totally dependent on the fact that the judiciary was there. What we've heard this evening is an extremely important statement because it is looking with sympathy, but also with intensity and with analytical force at where we actually are with the judiciary and what we do with, for example, the decisions that have been taken by the Supreme Court. I was very struck by two things which I think we need to keep in mind, that perhaps historically the position has changed somewhat from what it was 70 years ago, and even the judiciary has to take into consideration what might be the political motivations of some of the cases it is asked to consider. Uh, one is particularly struck by the two, of, of the many, the two that were discussed this evening, the Shabari Malai and the Ram Janabhumi, where the issues, in a sense, are not just legal issues. There are other issues that come in and impinge on the legality, and the court has to be very aware of this. And certainly to a lay person like myself, one has had the feeling that the court was not aware of this or was not giving it the attention that it deserved, that there are other dimensions. Uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that in every activity that is considered, um, 
there are symbols and there are issues which go beyond perhaps just the directly legal issues. The court may not be in a position to pass judgment on these, but I think that an awareness of these is extremely important. Can the Supreme Court then protect our rights? This is an absolutely fundamental question today, uh, which I think should be discussed much more fully than it is. It's not only in the hands of the court, it's not only in the hands of lawyers, it's in the hands of every citizen. And therefore the uh, remarks that Justice Shah made about the need for transparency and availability are absolutely crucial if in fact citizens are to be drawn into understanding the processes by which judgments are arrived at and citizens have in fact got to do that and have to be allowed to do that and have to be persuaded to do that. That's the whole point of being a citizen with rights and duties. Um, the extensive aspects of certain things come through very clearly, for example, when we as historians listen to what is being said about migration. Because this is one issue on which I can say, I think with perfect confidence, that history as we know it, culture, civilizations, and so on, would not exist as they have existed but for migrations. It is people coming in and people going out and the exchange of ideas and goods and what have you that create cultures and that create civilizations. So to have blanket terms of objecting to migrations, whatever the present current contemporary problem may be, I think it has to be seen as an ongoing process with certain differences coming in and not as an absolute that comes out of our situation. Um, and the last point I want to make is that I'm, I'm very pleased at the underlining that was done of um, the need for the judiciary to go along with the Constitution. The Constitution is, in fact, the fundamental democracy, uh, uh, fundamental uh, uh, aspect of a democratic society. Let's not forget that historically, again, I'm sorry to be constantly coming back to history, but I do feel that there is a purpose and function in knowing how these institutions came about. Citizenship is not something that dropped like manna from heaven. Citizenship is a historical phase. It's a historical phase in which our relationship to the nation changes, our relationship to the state changes. We begin to have rights and the state has duties towards us. We have obligations. This is totally different from what was there in a pre-citizen state, uh, for example, in the 19th century in, in India. And the constitution then is the document, the contract between the citizen and the state as I see it. And therefore, every arm of the state, every aspect and institution of the state has to consider its activities in terms of how they relate to the Constitution. And I think this underlining that was done this, this evening is absolutely crucial. Um, so may I ask you once again to join me in expressing very grateful thanks for a thoughtful, insightful lecture. Thank you, Justice Shah, for that illuminating talk, and thanks to Professor Romila Thapar for lifting the discussion to a scholarly and historical level. Uh, as a self-appointed activist group, if I may be permitted, Madam, as chair, can I ask one question? We have heard a rather brilliant and insightful analysis of various issues, particularly the Supreme Court. But a question that I would ask all of you, and I really want an answer, if not right away, later on, what should we do? I asked 
madam, while sitting there, how do we fight this? She shook her head. So the people, particularly without white hair, the young people with black hair, please tell us what needs to be done. So on that note, uh, once again, thanks to both of you. And thanks a lot to each and every one of you who has come here. And uh, we hope to learn from you in the coming days and uh, weeks. Thank you so much.